Welcome to The Apple Seed, where we bring you and your family great stories from great storytellers. On today's episode, we'll hear from the Minnesota storyteller, Kevin Kling. All of a sudden, the worst 4th of July became the best 4th of July. And we'll hear songs and stories from the terrific storyteller and musician, Josh Goforth. Now, I was very fortunate because I got to know six of my great-grandparents. Can you imagine that? Six of my great-grandparents. I'm your host, Sam Payne, and today we're listening to stories about ancestors, grandparents, great-grandparents, and those who were lucky enough to know them and learn from them. First, we'll meet Kevin Kling's German grandfather, a hard-working farmer who Kevin says could fix anything. The story is called Grandpa's Stars. We recorded it live in the Appleseed studio, and we're happy to bring it to you now. Here's Kevin. So one of my favorite places, one of the places I was always really, really happy was my grandparents' farm. We had what was called unstructured time, which now they call boredom. (laughs) But I was never bored on that farm, and I've not been bored to this day. I've been to places where I wished I was somewhere else, and I've been to plays where I would have fallen asleep if I hadn't been the one talking. (laughs) But I still have never been bored, and I've got my grandparents to thank. My grandpa was one of those German farmers as wide as he was tall. We used to say if it wasn't for the direction of his buttons, we wouldn't have known if he was laying down or standing up. (laughs) And the story that sums him up best, I think, is a story of a Minnesota farmer. He had 162 acres, which isn't very much land at all. And he was so proud of his land. He was so proud of his farm. And one day, a guy from Texas was visiting. The Minnesotan was bragging about his farm, and the Texan said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. He said, my ranch in Texas, I get in my truck in the morning, and I start driving. And by nightfall, I haven't hit the end of my ranch. And the Minnesotan said, yeah, I used to have a truck like that. So that's my grandpa. My grandma, she's one of those German farmer, the women, she's just amazing. She's, uh, the, uh, there's always a little fear around her though. Like there was this rooster on that farm and that rooster would peck me. And I'd say, grandma, the rooster's pecking me. And she'd say, just stay away from it. And I'd, I'd say, grandma. And then one day it pecked my sister and that night we ate chicken. <laughs> Toughest chicken I ever ate. But from that rooster I learned, be careful who you peck. This is a story I want to tell about my grandpa. My grandpa could fix anything. That was the thing about him. He would even, he, he, he would come to our house and spend two weeks every summer in our house fixing everything in our house. He'd fix the stove. He'd plane the doors. He would do everything in the house. And in two weeks, our, he would transform our house. And, he, and I remember, you know, the, the toilet would be completely disassembled. And my mom's like, I've got company coming in an hour. It was back together again, no problem. He was just so amazing at fixing every single thing in the house. And I remember uh, uh, my grandpa was there one day during his two week stay and they were painting the house and my brother and I were playing and we were always in the way. They said, get out of here, you kids, go into the backyard. So we went into the backyard and my brother and I were playing with a ball and we were kicking it back and forth to each other. And I took the ball and I kicked it further than I ever kicked it. And it went over the house and we heard this, ah! <laughs> we went around the house and there was the ball in the bucket of paint and my my grandpa covered in paint. It had gone in the paint. And they said, how did this happen? I don't know, I don't know. I said, I don't know, someone kicked the ball over. And I was like, oh man. And my dad was laughing so hard we didn't get punished for a while. But <laughs> when he came to his senses, then he realized, he said, you kids are grounded. You're grounded. And so we had to spend that night in our own backyard. And the problem was, it was the 4th of July. Best night to go out for fireworks. And we couldn't, we had to sit in the backyard with my grandpa, who I could tell still harbored a bit of a grudge from that ball. And so we're sitting next to my grandpa. And I have to say, Minnesotans, we're kind of known for our silences. We don't talk very much. And my grandpa could sit for hours and never say a word, but it had no bearing on how he felt about you. We know in Minnesota that silences aren't measured by length, they're measured by depth. And my grandpa, I could tell that when he lost his brother, that he loved his brother very much because his silence was deep and we can only grieve as deeply as we love. 
So my grandpa and I were sitting there next to each other, and you could barely see the fireworks over the tops of these trees. I'm like, this is the worst 4th of July ever. My grandpa is going, ooh, ah, there's a pretty one. Oh, what, grandpa, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, there's a rose and a tulip and and a daisy. What? And he goes, oh, he says there's lilies and lilacs and lavender. My grandpa thought the fireworks were flowers. And so I I thought, hey, remember my imagination? I thought, I'm going to let it go on purpose this time and follow my grandpa through his fireworks garden. And so I did. And no sooner had I done that, there's marigolds, there's orchids, there's snapdragons, there's sunflowers. All of a sudden, the worst 4th of July became the best 4th of July. And then the fireworks stopped and the stars came out. And my grandpa and I are standing there and, and we're looking up at the stars and he says, Kevin, you know, those are the ancestors. And they're looking down. They have seen everything, everything that's come before, everything that's come after. They're like a land of forgotten things waiting to be retrieved. And I said, Grandpa, there's the Big Dipper. I learned about it in school. And he goes, yeah, he said, very good, Kevin. I go, and and, and, and there's Orion. You can tell by the three stars that make up his belt. He says, that's really good, Kevin. He says, do you know what that one is? I said, no, Grandpa, I don't think that is a constellation, Grandpa. He said, it is now. I call it the wiener dog. And I look, I go, that, well, that does look like a wiener dog. And then <laughs> and I go, okay, Grandpa, what's that one there? He goes, I don't know. And I go, that's our neighbor, the guy with the nose. He goes, that is a guy with the nose. And he says, what's this? And it looked like two circles. And I go, I don't, oh, I do know. Pepperoni pizza, large and small, major and minor. He said, very good, Kevin. And, uh, and then, oh, and then I said, Grandpa, do you know what that one is? He goes, it looks like a squirrel. I say, it is, it is, it's a squirrel. I'm really good. And I go, and what's next to the squirrel? He goes, is that a shark? Yes, shark and squirrel, unlikely best friends, a new constellation by Kevin Kling. And he says, <laughs> and he says very good. And we, we watch the stars all night. And then all of a sudden he says, Kevin, there's the wishing star. Make a wish. And I said, all right, I wish, I wish. He said, what'd you wish for? And I said, I wish... I wish that ball didn't land in that paint, Grandpa. It was me that kicked it over. I'm really sorry. And he said, that's okay, Kevin. He said, it was pretty funny. And I said, it actually, it was really funny. And he said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> and my grandpa and I sat out there, and we watched the stars all through the night. And all of a sudden, he says, you know, Kevin, one day I'm going to be up in those stars looking down at you. And I said, I know, Grandpa but that's not tonight. And he said, no, that's not tonight. We stood out there under the stars the rest of the night, and that is when I knew my grandpa could fix anything. That was Kevin Kling with Grandpa's Stars. I loved hearing Kevin talk about how the people who have gone on before us can be the stars that guide us. And hearing that story puts me in the middle of a memory. When I was a young man, I spent some time working as a missionary. And I loved the work, and I loved the people with whom I was working, but I was far from home, living in Argentina. And it was easy sometimes to get preoccupied with the future, about how my life would be when I came back to my home in America after I was done being a missionary. And sometimes those future days occupied my thoughts rather than the days I was actually living at the moment. And I remember one day, a couple of us going to visit an old woman in the neighborhood where we lived. And as we sat in her living room, chatting around glasses of lemonade, she said something I think I'll always remember. She said, I have lived a long time. And for years, I lived by gaining new experiences and saving them up. A little like putting things in a bag that grew larger with each experience I put into it. And now, at the end of my long life, I'm living by taking things out of the bag, turning them over in my memory, and sharing their stories. 
And that's a little bit of a paraphrase, but not much. That's about what she said. And I remember leaving her home filled with a sense of urgency to be where I was, to remember the things I was doing right then, and to store the stories of those things up as I suddenly felt that there would be a time when those experiences would come out of the bag to nourish and sustain me, and maybe even to nourish and sustain the people who might come after me. Well, that's where Kevin's story took me. Where did it take you? And who will you take along? It'll have us all climbing that family tree where we share together the apple seed. It's great to have you with us, and I want to introduce you to another show from the BYU Radio family of podcasts. The show is called In Good Faith, and in this podcast, Stephen Cat Perry, the host, in each episode talks with a different person about that person's faith tradition. These guests talk about their relationship with the divine that will strengthen your faith, and Steve is a great Listener. It's a podcast that helps you celebrate the power of faith and belief, a podcast on which you'll hear stories and accounts from believers of all kinds told in their own words. You can listen to In Good Faith wherever you hear our show. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, all kinds of places to listen to In Good Faith on demand. If you're hungry for the stories, come and feed from the fruit of the tree of the apple seed. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and we're ready to welcome Josh Goforth to the apple seed. Josh will share memories of his great grandparents and neighbors from the hills of North Carolina. He'll share some traditional tunes, too, and you're going to love it. We recorded it all live in the apple seed studio. Here's Josh Goforth. <laughs> Well, I was very lucky to grow up in Madison County, North Carolina. That's just north of Asheville. And I'm sure if you're listening at home or here in the studio, you might have been to Asheville. Uh, Asheville is a special place to me. Some great music, great food, and of course, places like the Biltmore House. Uh, But north of Asheville in a little small community of uh, Marshall, North Carolina is where I grew up. And I was really lucky to grow up there because these are folks that grew up on creek beds, I guess you could say, and each community had its own kind of uh, particular way of doing things. In fact, my mom and dad's family grew up in two different communities, from the way they made cornbread to the way they strung up beans in the field. Everything was quite different. Even the music was different. Now, I was very fortunate because I got to know six of my great-grandparents. Can you imagine that? Six of my great-grandparents. And one of my favorite things to do would be to go to their house, sit on their front porch, and have them tell me tales of when they were boys and girls. And now these were folks that were born in the late 1800s, like my Paul Baker. Paul Baker told me when he was five years old on a dare, he rode across the Pigeon River on a sow hog. And I asked Paul, I said, well, weren't you scared, Paul? He said, well, I wasn't scared not one bit. He said, I'd watch mommy wash enough dishes to know that grease floats on water. (laughs) Or somebody like my Grandma Worley. Now, Grandma Worley was somebody that got a TV way, way later on, after everybody else in the community had gotten one. And she finally got her a TV, and she got one station, and it was super snowy. And her two favorite programs were The Price is Right, and the other program that she loved was Wrestling. And oh, she would get into that wrestling and she would just scream at the TV. And she had her a little Greer applesauce can that she'd spit in. And the more she'd watch that wrestling, the more she would spit. And all of a sudden, if somebody got hurt, oh, she'd get real, real quiet. And she'd just look and just get real solemn. And it would never fail that that Sunday, if a wrestler got hurt during the week, that she'd ask prayer for him at church. <laughs> That's how much she got into it. Or somebody like Granny Ette. Granny Ette was the strongest person I knew. Granny Ette was a snake dealer. Now, you may not know what that is, but snake dealer is someone who goes out and they catch copperheads and rattlesnakes and they sell them to snake handling churches. 
and she would do that on the side for extra money. So she was a pretty strong woman. Now, she would hitchhike everywhere. That's how just bold she was. And she told me when she was a little girl, she never had a baby doll, but she always wanted a baby doll so bad. She said, oh, honey, why, Mommy would make us those corn shuck dolls, you know, where they'd take the shucks out of corn and just flip it around and just take the silk and wind around it and make pretty little dolls. But, oh, I'd go down to Marshall and I'd see those pretty dolls in the wind, and I wanted one so bad. Well, when she got old enough to have kids, and they got old enough to have kids, and they got old enough to have kids, meaning she had great-grandchildren, we all started buying her baby dolls for Christmas. Now, she lived in this little cabin, and there was one bulb that came down from the ceiling, and it was really, really dim. And that one-room cabin, she had nailed those baby dolls <laughs> to the walls of the cabin. And as a kid, they were all looking down at me. <laughs> and she would sit in her rocking chair with the most wrinkled face and long, stringy hair, and she would just look at those baby dolls and go, <laughs> scared me to death. <laughs> so it wasn't a surprise when she escaped from the nursing home on the day that they put her in there. She convinced someone that her son had took her there to visit her sister, and they just gave her a ride to Marshall, which is about a mile away. Well, the second time she escaped from the nursing home, she hitchhiked from Marshall, North Carolina, all the way to Newport, Tennessee, which is about an hour and a half trip by car. And the only reason they caught her was because my great uncle, her son, was selling tobacco in Newport, Tennessee. And he was driving along and he said, Lord, there's mama. <laughs> and he picked her up and took her back. She had a pistol with a huge long snout on it. And she had $800 in her right pocket inside of her coat. She was a strong woman. Now, she also said that when she was a little girl, that down in Marshall, the riverboat captains would come, and they would drive barges from Asheville into Marshall. And the boatmen would sing songs as they were rowing the boats into Marshall to unload all their cargo. And so I want to teach you a song that's famous in that little community where she grew up. And this community is over in the Laurel section of Madison County. This is a place where you couldn't throw a rock without hitting a banjo picker. So that's how many banjo pickers there were. So I'd love to do this song, and I want to get you all to help me with it if you could. And if you're sitting at home, uh, you can sing right along with me too, or maybe you're uh, in your car listening on the radio, or maybe you're on your rubbing phone. That's what we, in Madison County, there's this old woman, she come up to me and she says, all my grand has got them rubbing phones. They just rub on them all day long. <laughs> she said, I'm gonna get me one of them. So even if you're on your rubbing phone listening, to the apple seed, you can sing this song with me, and it's one of the songs that the boatman used to sing. It's called The Boatman. and dance for more dance oh dance boatman dance dance all night to the broad daylight go home with the girls in the morning hi ho the boatman roll float down the river call the ohio now in this song it's real simple all you have to do is do just like the boatman and marshall you just yell hi ho are you ready one two here we go hi ho the boatman roll float down the river call the ohio that's it you may even feel like dancing if you're home Fifty man, he'll take anything that he well can. Never seen a pretty girl in my life. What what married and a boatman's wife dance? Oh, dance, boatman, dance. Said dance all night to the broad daylight. Go home with the girls in the morning. Here we go. Hi ho, the boatman roll, float down the river, call the Ohio. Better watch. 
watch out or your daughter's gone. He took my sheep and he took my goat. He put them in a sack, then he put them on the boat. Dance, pretty mean. Dance, boatman, dance. Dance all night to the broad daylight. Go home with the girls in the morning. Here we go. Hi-ho, the boatman roll float down the river. Call the Ohio one more time. Hi-ho, the boatman roll float down the river. Call the Ohio. Well, growing up in Madison County, there was about every kind of Baptist there is. We were missionary Baptists. We had Southern Baptists, Free Will Baptists, Regular Baptists, Standard Baptists, American Baptists, Primitive Baptists, Deepwater Baptists, Snake Handling Baptists, Foot Washing Baptists, Plain Old Primitive Standard Baptist, American Standard Baptist, and what my mom's family called Buzzard Baptist. Now, that's a Baptist who only goes to church when somebody dies. And even then, sometimes they only circle around it. <laughs> So now you can imagine when I brought the fiddle home what my family on my mom's side might have said because, you know, the fiddle is supposed to be the devil's instrument. In fact, I'll never forget there's this old fella over in the community over there on Big Pine. You know, I went over there and brought my fiddle, and he said, Boy, better lay that fiddle down. I don't lead to nothing but a bunch of gambling and a drinking and a fighting and, worst of all, dancing. <laughs> He said, the devil lives in that fiddle. That is the devil's play box. The devil lives in that thing. Well, I went to his wife and I said, well, he told me that the devil lived in the fiddle. And she said, oh, Lord, he's crazy and alone. The devil don't live in the fiddle. Lives in the fiddler. <laughs> well, I kept playing. And finally, I did take the fiddle back over there to their house. And I played Amazing Grace. And from that point on, they were just fine with me playing fiddle. But when I picked up the fiddle, I just fell in love with it because the fiddle, or the violin, as you all probably know, by the way, there's no difference between the violin and the fiddle. They're both exactly the same instrument. It's just how you play it. And fiddle tunes are for dancing, and they get a rhythm going with a bow. And I want to play one of the first fiddle tunes I learned when I was a kid growing up in Madison County. And this is one that I remember my granddad used to sing. And my granddad uh, would sing it all the time on the porch. Now, he was quite a character himself. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story about my granddad. One time he told me about the way he asked for my grandma's hand in marriage. He said, do you know how I did it? And I said, well, you probably got down on one knee and give her a ring and everything and ask her, will you marry me? And he said, no, that ain't what I asked her. I said, do you want to be buried with my people? <laughs> that's love. When you're that far, that's love. So here is Sally Gooden.
Josh go forth with stories about his ancestors, as well as a couple of traditional tunes, The Boatman and Sally Gooden. A big thanks to Kevin Kling and Josh Goforth for the stories they shared today. What memories do you have of your grandparents or great-grandparents? If they're still with you, what stories could you ask them to tell you? They're a living link to past generations, past ways of doing things. There's a lot to learn from those stories. We hope you'll seek out your family stories because at The Appleseed, we believe that sharing and listening to great stories can change your family's world. The Appleseed is produced by Wendy Folsom, Sam Payne, and Brian Tanner. Our audio engineers are Ashton Parkinson and Carly Wilson. The rest of the Appleseed team is Kelly Wehrmeister, Trent Horton, Evadane Hendricks, Miriam Ice, and Tristan Schetzel. A special thanks to the subscribers of our podcast who rate us or leave reviews. You help people find the show. We also love to receive emails at theappleseed at byu.edu. Your thoughts and comments help us to shape the future of the Appleseed. We're pleased and proud to be among the many podcasts produced by the BYU Radio family. And you can find episodes of The Appleseed wherever podcasts are found, on the BYU Radio app or at byuradio.org slash appleseed. I'm Sam Payne, and the whole team can't wait to be with you again on The Appleseed.